Hello economists, this is Jeff Beckstrom here with another AP Microecon review video. Today I'm going to be going over the recently released uh, 2020 exam practice FRQ questions for the AP Microeconomics exam. Uh, you can see those here. So on to the first question. Uh, sample question number one is two short questions, so we'll kind of treat it like three questions. Uh, here's our supply and demand graph. So calculate the total producer's surplus at the market equilibrium price and quantity. This is a simple area of a triangle. The producer surplus, remember, is bounded by the supply curve, the quantity, so in the quantity is unrestricted here, and the price. So the market equilibrium price being $20 and the quantity being 20 units. Our area of a triangle, very simple here. So $20, 20 units divided by 2 equals... 200. So $200 is our total producer surplus for part A. For part B, if the government imposes a price floor at 16, is there a shortage, a surplus, or neither? A little bit of a trick question here on part B. A price floor at 16, this line right here, would mean that the price is unable to go below that, but the invisible hand of the market doesn't want the price to go below that anyways. So uh, that would have no effect. And the explanation should be something to the extent that uh, a effective price floor needs to be above the natural equilibrium price. In this case, it's below, so it's an ineffective price floor. For part C, if instead the government imposed a price ceiling at $12, so that'll be an effective price control. So here's $12 at a price ceiling. The quantity that producers are willing and able to supply is 12 units, whereas at $12, consumers are willing and able to purchase or are demanding 24 units. So in that case, we'll have a shortage, and the shortage difference is 12 units. Uh, and if instead the government restricts the market output to 10 units, calculate the deadweight loss. Okay, so uh, quota here at 10 units. Uh, so the deadweight loss, if this uh, market is restricted to only 10 units, is this little triangle right here, the area of total surplus that's not realized because of the limit on the number of transactions. Remember, deadweight loss in this situation is created by the loss of a transaction. So anytime anything comes between a buyer and a seller, um, we can call that deadweight loss. So uh, under any other normal condition, the buyer and the seller would have found each other. In this case, they can't because the government says 10 units only. So our triangle is $30 high. Uh, or excuse me, the base of the triangle is $30, and the height of the triangle is 10 units. Um, so 30 times 10 is 300 divided by 2 is $150 of deadweight loss. Assume the price decreases from 20 to 12. Calculate the price elasticity of demand and show your work. Okay, so on the demand curve, if the price goes from 20 down to 12, uh, what we see is uh, this section. So this section of demand. So once the arc elasticity of demand, uh, arc price elasticity of demand over this section of the demand curve right here. Remember, for elasticity calculations, you need to put quantity change, uh, percent quantity change over percent price change. I like to remember this thinking about um, myself as a young man eating lots of uh, quarter pounders and uh, getting very large and eating elastic waistband pants. So when you think elasticity, think elastic waistband. You need an elastic waistband if you eat lots of quarter pounders. Quantity over price. Okay, <laughs> I know, that's pretty silly. Um, anyhow, so our percent change, and I've done the calculation here on the little board for you. Uh, our percent change is, uh, so our difference, 24 minus 20 uh, over 20, so we get a 20% increase in quantity and 12, or 20 minus 12, or is eight divided by 20, so a 40% decrease in price. So 20% over 40%, our elasticity coefficient is 0 0.5, which for part F means that it is a relatively inelastic portion of the demand curve. All right, on to the second part of question one. Uh, the second part of question one is a payoff matrix question. I love when I see these on the AP test because they're so easy. Um, the first thing I always do is redraw the payoff matrix or write on it if it's a paper test. Um, oh, whoopsie, I erased a little bit of it here. So you can see I've redrawn the payoff matrix uh, like so with air touch over here and windward at the top and I've marked on it a little bit already. What I've marked is uh, my own little shorthand for determining um, dominant strategy. So 
Uh, once I've redrawn the payoff matrix, what I want to do is take the vertical line that goes through the middle of the payoff matrix, the one that points towards uh, the company on the top, in this case, Windward, and I want to draw arrows across that line, either to the left or the right, to indicate which one of the options is the best for that company. All right. So for Windward, morning or evening, right? if Air Touch chooses morning, Windward would rather have 700 than 600. So I drew my arrow pointing this way across that line. And down here, if uh, Air Touch chooses evening, Windward would rather have 950 than 800. So I drew my arrow in that direction. In this case, we can tell that morning is a dominant strategy for Windward because, make this a little bit bigger, uh, because whether air touch chooses morning or evening, uh, the morning departure is always best for Windward. So we have a dominant strategy for Windward. Um, to find any dominant strategy for the player on the left, in this case it's air touch, um, we use the horizontal line going across the middle of the payoff matrix. And we look at the values and uh, compare it across that horizontal line. So, which one's better, 1,000 or 750? We draw our arrow towards the 1,000 because I'd rather have that, of course, um, but 900 is better than 700. So, for air touch, there is no dominant strategy because our little arrows that we drew are pointing in opposite directions. Um, so, the next portion of the question, or a later portion of the question, is going to ask us about a Nash equilibrium, and those little arrows will help us find that as well. So uh, anytime you see a payoff matrix, so part A, anytime you see a payoff matrix, the first thing I always do is, you know, dominant strategy analysis so I can kind of get my mind straight on the question. Um, but uh, for part G, it's asking us which uh, market structure. It's always oligopoly. Um, just memorize that. And remember, it's oligopoly because there are so few firms that the firm's decisions make them uh, interdependent. So um, Windward and AirTouch have impact on each other's uh, profitability based upon their pricing or departure decisions in this case. Uh, so that's our definition of interdependent. So your explain for Part G should mention that word interdependent to make sure you get full credit for a question like that. If Windward chooses evening, which departure is better for AirTouch? Um, it's quite easy. So if Windward chooses evening over here. AirTouch is now choosing between these two and evening is best for AirTouch. Um, identify the dominant strategy for windward, that's morning, we already went through that. Is choosing evening a dominant strategy for air touch? Uh, it is not a dominant strategy because if windward chooses morning, it's better for air touch to leave in the morning, but if windward chooses evening, it's better for air touch to leave in the evening. That's what your uh, explanation should say. And you could go on to say something to the extent of a more general statement like uh, air touch's best outcome varies depending upon what windward chooses. If both firms know all the information in the payoff matrix, then we're going to arrive at what we call the Nash equilibrium. And in the Nash equilibrium square, in this case, that's the one that two arrows are pointing into. So if you drew the arrows earlier, like I suggested, and like uh, I really think you should do in order to never get anything wrong on these questions, um, it's the box with two arrows pointing into it. If there's two boxes with two arrows pointing into them, then we don't have a Nash equilibrium or a solution, but we rarely see those questions uh, set up like that by the College Board on the AP test. Okay, so in this case, Windward's daily profit so is going to be 700 is the correct answer for part K. Uh, now, on to the next question. I don't have anything drawn up for that. So let's look at question two together. So let's see. We have perfect competition product market and labor market parts in this question. So... Um, Especially on this year's AP test, you should really expect the College Board test writers to throw uh, topics from multiple units into each question. This is a good example of a question from Unit 3, Perfect Competition, being combined with something from Factor Markets, which is typically covered in the fifth unit, although it, your teacher may have done it a little bit differently. All right, uh, so we have peaches and nectarines, our substitute goods. During reading time for this question, um, make sure that you're highlighting, underlining, etc etc some key pieces like this part where it says substitute goods that's going to become important sometimes they'll tell you things like this that don't matter in the question just to kind of throw you off but commonly all of that information is necessary so don't panic if you don't feel like you incorporated every single piece of information in the question um, just trust your own analysis but pay careful attention to every piece that they give you all right uh, so Joyce a producer in the peach industry discovers a breakthrough uh, that reduces Joyce's cost of producing peaches. Um, 
the setup to this part of the question leaves a little question in my mind about, hey, uh, is this technology widely adopted? But if I read the whole question first, I'll notice later in the second part of the question narrative um, that it implies that uh, previously other peach producers had not been incorporating that new technology and then they do. Uh, so up here for part A, um, for Joyce, the quantity of peaches that Joyce produces um, is going to increase because Joyce's marginal cost is going to fall uh, based upon that technological breakthrough. Um, the price of peaches is going to remain constant. So if Joyce is the only producer in the industry, um, it's still a perfectly competitive industry, and so all firms are still price takers. Joyce could offer a lower price, but remember, as part of the definition for a perfectly competitive industry, Joyce already sells everything that Joyce can produce. So offering a lower price because Joyce has reduced her cost um, doesn't make sense for Joyce because she can still sell all of her peaches at the market price, whatever the market price might be. Um, so Joyce will earn positive short-run economic profits in this situation um, because of the decrease in cost. Both marginal cost and average total cost will fall for Joyce. Uh, now assume all their peach producing firms. So eventually everyone else discovers this same thing. Uh, the adoption of this new technology should see the price of peaches come down because this is uh, a new production technology is a determinant of supply as you covered in unit two. So they're throwing another unit in here on this question. Supply should shift to the right, increasing market quantity and decreasing market price. Um, so price goes down, quantity goes up for part D and E. Um, this new technology is not available to those poor nectarine producers. Uh, explain how the changes that occurred in the peach industry will affect the following in the nectarine industry. So since peaches and nectarines are substitute goods, lower prices for peaches means less demand for nectarines. So demand will shift in in the nectarine market, which decreases the quantity and price of nectarines exchanged in the market. So price goes down, quantity goes down. Um, this is the kind of question where it's typically good to use some scratch paper or scratch space on a paper test to draw a little supply and demand graph just to make sure that you're not shifting the wrong curve or shifting a curve in the wrong direction and that you get those price and quantity answers. Since there's no explain element here for part F and part G, if you make a mistake and just put the wrong answer, there's nothing for the grader to do other than mark you wrong for that entire part. Uh, okay, and then in some factor market stuff in the end of that question, oopsie daisy. Uh, the graph above depicts the supply and demand curves for the workers in the nectarine industry. Uh, so it's asking us about uh, the concept of derived demand here. So if demand falls in the nectarine industry, we should see demand fall for the factors of production for nectarines, workers being the primary factor of production, presumably as they are with most industries. Um, so the graph above depicts the supply and demand curve for workers in the nectarine industry before the technological breakthrough in the peach industry. Explain how the technological breakthrough in the peach industry will affect each of the following. So demand for nectarine labor is going to shift in, which is going to drop the wage. So wage rates going to fall and the number of workers hired to produce nectarines will also fall. Uh, that's it for these two practice questions for the AP test in 2020. Good luck on the new format this year and I will see you all next time. Thanks.